just a, a quick overview of how, how the forests are regenerating themselves, um, what the impacts of weeds are on that, and, ha and how you can tackle that if, you know, in the case of some people who are doing volunteer work in local parks, but also in your own gardens where you've got this, this uh, sort of native vegetation. Um, so just a quick one about me. I'm a plant ecologist, um, so I'm a Kalorama resident, um, um, very local. I work for the Victorian government in the um, Flora and Fauna Research Institute, so my work's on, on um, a lot of my work is on how plants and forests um, uh, respond to disturbance, mostly bushfires, but um, obviously windstorms and other form of disturbance. And I've been a um, um, long time volunteer in the Danidongs as well, so um, I'm sort of coming at it from a few angles here. Um, so this is just a bit of an overview of what's happening in the forest after the storm. You've probably observed a lot of this yourself. This is a picture down at Calorama Park. Um, I, I think what was what's always amazes me even after seeing this for many, many years is how quickly a lot of things re-sprout after, after disturbance like the storm. So the tree ferns, the understory mother shield ferns, the, the tall shrubs like the austral mulberry and the musk daisy bush and so on. And so that that really um, provides that first layer of protection um, against, against weed invasion. Um, the other thing I imagine some of you would have observed on your own properties where there was a lot of tree clearing, big machinery came in, we've seen this in Jan Fields Place over the road and um, others, where you know there's been a massive soil disturbance with big, big machinery, not necessarily all, all the big damage that fell over were taken away. Um, but what, what's really heartened me is that there's been an extraordinary regrowth of, of, um, of the native plants, the forest plants. So some things will only come back from seed, so the mountain ash, the big, the, the big the overstory trees and the blackwood bottles, they'll eventually form the canopy, but they're coming back primarily from, from seed that was in the soil. Um, but there's been a lot of other native things that have come up either from, from seed or, or re-sprouted. So, they're now covering covering the ground. Of course, there's weeds in amongst it, but but it's that um, it, it's it's making it's I suppose helping that that along where you're tipping the balance towards the native things becoming dominant and out competing the the, weed, the weedy stuff rather than having to go and pull the weeds yourself. It's 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 I guess being a bit strategic about which ones to tackle. Um, Oh, that's just a bit about the mountain ash. Probably know all about that. They they, they take a long time before they grow up and mature and set seed. Um, so I, I guess I've got a little bit of a quiz for everyone today. And there's some some on the table there. There's a lot of these early colonising native plants that come up that actually look very weedy, and you'd be tempted to sort of go, oh, that's terrible. We've got to pull them all out. But um, in actual fact, they provide they, they they serve a good purpose. They provide some cover initially. They they come up quickly. They they only last. Their lifespan is only while the other more um, long-lived shrubs and trees get established. So there's an example. There's on the left the, the nightshade, which is a weed, and on the right, uh, called Indian weed, but it's not a weed, it's a, it's a native plant, and those, those are on the table over there if you want to have a closer look. And I chose these because they are just everywhere around us on, on the blocks that were cleared. Um, and the, the, this Indian weed now is starting to, to just sort of die back now because a lot of the other more um, long-lived uh, native shrubs and trees are, are getting quite big and quite established. So um, you can save yourself a lot of bother by not pulling out the native things that look a bit weedy, if you know what they are. Um, Excuse me, that, does oh, that, that nightshade, does yeah. that have little berries on it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just pulled the whole thing. Oh, yeah, that's, that's no, 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 certainly oh. pull, certainly, <laughs> uh, certainly <laughs> pull that one out. That's the weedy one, the black one. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 this was just a bit of contrast because they're growing okay. all together. And you know, yeah. at, at first you sort of look across and think, oh look, there's all these weeds. Yeah. And some, you know, half of them are probably the nightshade, which yes, definitely pull out. Okay. And then yeah. half of them are probably this other thing, which is which is a native, native yeah. thing. So, um, so you know, there's not as many weeds there as perhaps as all, but yeah, definitely the weedy ones on the left and the, the native one on, yeah. the, on the right. And there's a, there's another example. This inkweed shrub has come up, you know, coming to disturbed areas where we hadn't seen it before, but. But the, you know, the native kangaroo apple also is, is, is sort of coming up and providing um, that initial sort of shelter. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. And there's other examples, and I've got a couple on the table there, of the sort of um, native herbaceous things that grow, you know, bidgy bidgy and um, what else have I got over there? The hound's tongue. Oh, the hound's tongue, yeah. which looks very weedy, you know, like it's kind of scratchy and looks a bit, it looks like it could be something introduced, but 
you know, but it's not, and, and, and so they're, they're sort of covering the ground and forming, uh, you know, sort of protecting the soil and, and, and stopping other weeds coming in, which is good. Um, so that's a bit about that. But um, so, I mean, f fairly obvious to you all, and we, when you lose the trees, we get more sunlight, and with all the soil disturbance, this provides a really good, really good conditions for weeds to thrive. Um, they either can come in from outside, you know, by birds dropping berries or, or wind seeds, you know, like the sycamores blowing in or daisy plants, so things like that coming in on the wind. Or, or there's existing um, plants that just really, you know, flourish because of the great conditions or there might be some, um, some weed seeds in the soil that are being suppressed by all the other, other vegetation that's now been removed. So um, that's, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward. But, um, I just wanted to use Calorama Park as an example because we're all, all pretty f familiar with it, I, I guess. Um, the Friends, Friends Group's got a, got a project to, um, to do some interpretive signage and really um, focus on May Moon um, track as, as a nature trail. So that really to look at how the forest recovers after the storm and to help that along and provide the opportunity to, for people to record those changes over time. And um, I think some of the things we've learnt there, or some of the things I've certainly observed, you know, could, could perhaps help you in your own own properties when you, if you've got um, native bushland that you want to um, want to sort of um, uh, you know tackle the waste in. So one of the things is is is, is staging the work. Um, you know, there's areas that are just beyond the scope of volunteers. We were lucky to get a grant and we're, and we're able to get. Um, Sandra Grunvold from um, Diverse Bushland Management um, to, to do a, a big patch on a steep slope um, and also Trevor McIntosh from Parks Victoria did some blackberry spraying. So that's really given us a kick along so now we can just tackle the, the easier stuff along the edges and, that, and I think, I think that's, the, that's the thing is not to go, oh look it's all terribly weedy and it's all terribly difficult, it's to think of bits to do at a time and, and, and how to stage that. And, and, um, and the other, the other other thing we, we learned tonight, it's the same mistake. We had a had a, some planting that we did, and some of the things that I've, I've noticed since then have, have made me think again about removing all the weeds in one big go. Because we we to do our little patch where we fenced from the deer, we we cut and painted a lot of sycamore maples, you know, cut and painted them with herbicide to, to make a nice bare area for our planting. And of course, some other weeds came into that spot, so. I think that the lesson there was to sort of, you know, do it in patches, um, like do it gradually, and also pick, and this is sort of a separate issue, but pick certain plants that are not, not delicious for deer, and, um, <laughs> and that are quite tough, and those tough plants can, you know, that, that can survive and, and thrive, they can start to shade out the weeds, and then we can establish the other, other native plants. So I suppose that, that might be, might be um, something you could think about on your own properties if you're actually doing replanting. But, um, um, is to yeah to, to, to not remove everything else. So I guess that's just sort of a summary of what what what, what that is. <laughs> um, you know, you can save yourself a bit of bother by not having to clear everything if you recognise what's a native plant and just remove the weeds around them and let them thrive. And then prioritise. There's, there's so many weeds, but a lot of weeds are not are not going to be terribly problematic in the long run. You really want to look at the plants that are that are um, long lived, like woody woody things, essentially things that are, you know, and the things that can look terrible for the for the short term, but other things will shade them out. And some things really only grow along the edge. You know, they look terrible when you're walking on the tracks, but when you get into the bush itself, they're really not that invasive. So really, don't try and do everything. I'd say um, do it in stages. Prioritise the weeds that are that are the most long lived and and um, and, and and invasive. So. Um, this is a couple of <laughs> a couple of things about ivy. My my most hated weed, of course, goes up all the trees. It's so difficult to get rid of. One one idea, and I know Roger will go into many 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 techniques about how to, how to tackle all sorts of weeds. But we found if you can cut the cut it at the base, at least then it stops it. You know, cuts it off from its source at the ground, and and, and you know will we'll reduce it on the trunks and. And, and, and it'll die back a bit. You'll still have it on the ground, but at least you won't have it up the trees. Um, and just one other thing, and this is something that I'm, I'm, I haven't tried this, but <laughs> Sandra recommended this with a, the ivy that goes in amongst the fibrous tree uh, tree fern trunks. Mm -hmm. Just scratch it and then dab it with the herbicide. Because it's 
impossible to pull it off. It just snaps off. I can, anyway. I can do that. Actually. You can go onto that. That's, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's five thousand hours. Yeah. <laughs> so you have, Roger will have all the details. About this is really just sort of a bit of an overview. So you know, sub, so summary. You know, that our forests are regenerating naturally. You know, work with them. Let the native things come up and reduce the weed competition. Don't try and do all your weeds. Pick the ones that are most invasive and long-lived um, and, and tackle them in, in, in stages. So I guess that's all for me. <laughs> As an overview. And I know, you know, I know there's people, but you know, this is one aspect. Other people have you know, other types of gardens in their property. So you know, this is really just focused on if you're, if you're interested in that, that side of it. Yeah. It's a really, uh, uh, has anyone been on along the main moon track recently? Yeah. You know, at Kalawang Park, yep. So, and many of us would have seen it before the storm. So we know what it looked like before the storm and, uh, and the uh, battling blackberries and things like that that used to literally cover the paths. And there's just been such an amazing amount of work done by the Friends of Kalarama Park as well as uh, the support from Parks Victoria. Yeah, and, yeah. That, and we had the, obviously the grant and we were able to, to get a specialist the new weed views. contractor in to do some work. Yeah. yeah. The new views. The new views. Oh, the yes. New views. <laughs> yes, we're all, we're all, um, yeah. we're all looking at our, at our, at our new views at the moment. There's, yeah. It was a really different experience. I went there. Um, uh, recently and just before we ran a, a forest nature walk with the net which was amazing and uh, and just the, the things that I used to see that used to be markers for me that I know I've got to hear yeah. was now gone so it was like it was like experiencing the Mermin track for the first time and we know that that is actually going to be connected as part of the ridge walk um, the ridge walk um, project um, and just to let you know, if you've got any questions about Ridge Walk, um, the team from Ridge Walk will be at the Chestnut Festival next Sunday. So, so um, we'll also be there as well. Um, so we'll have free plants and all good stuff as well. Um, but the Ridge Walk team will be there. I've been trying to connect a number of residents with the Ridge Walk team, and I'm thinking you've got them captured on Sunday. So <laughs> you've got them. Okay, probably not heard them. Okay, don't charge at them. But they'll be there Bitcoin. and they'll have, you know, <laughs> questions about it, etc. Because it's it's still something that we, um, uh, they were doing a lot of online um, uh, communication. But I said to them, you've got to be here. You've got to be here. So they've been at, at Linda Play Space, but I said, you've got to come to the Chestnut Festival. Because that's it's not exactly what we want to do at the Chestnut Festival. We want to do other stuff, which is yummy. Um, could, I, could I also do, before we, before we, I'm going to go on to Roger's talk very soon, but is there any questions, I, I think it's something I'd like to, from what I've just talked about, um, any particular questions that might be um, relevant to your properties or bushland? <laughs> and don't forget too though, if you do have questions or if you're unsure about anything, you can always just call council and speak to someone in our environment team. They'll be more than happy to have a chat to you. Anyway, I've got time afterwards. So yeah, 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 that's yeah, true. yeah. We'll be around. Anyway, I think I should probably finish up there and um, and let Roger get on oh, the nitty gritty of that. Oh, yeah. That, that's cool. Yeah, I'll yeah. set you up. Yeah. But with this and it, and it's got some amazing examples of those of those weeds and native plants. So please. Sometimes photos don't really, I find it always hard to see, but if I can see it and I can feel it and I can touch it, it kind of helps. So um, it's, a, it's yeah, yeah, so the less, I mean, let's have it, yeah, grab me afterwards. I mean, there's just a few examples of those ones where, you know, native plants that look a bit weedy and, and we've got, you know, we've got these two books, but there's other, all these resources that Deb's got up the back, which are fabulous. There's the, the brochures, but also um, iNaturalist, which is a great way of identifying plants some people mm. might use as well. Yeah. So yeah, look, in terms of, yeah, the first step is knowing what it is, I guess, isn't it? Being able to identify what what it is. So um, there's all these fabulous resources plus the plus the eye natural story can maybe the maybe the top tip. These are great books. Um, you know, you can get this one still I think at um Karinda Nursery yeah. or not on and off, it's still in Great book barn as well. Oh Bill Grape Book Barn. That's right. Yeah. And I don't know about this one, but it's out of the I'm yeah, I've never seen that. It's a very yeah. old book, but anyway, there's other other weight yeah. resources. Um, um twenty bucks for the sugar. It's a, it's a real um, So my name's Roger, I um, run a, a bush regeneration company called Forest Foreshore. So we're bushies, bush regenerators, very similar to my really good friend Sander, Diverse Bush, who was doing work at Calorama Park. So we're two of the smaller contractors that you'll find in all the dark corners doing strange things. What are they up to? 
Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I live in Calista, I've worked through the hills for, oh, well, generally the hills maybe for the last 15 years. Um, my house has been flooded, flooded three times, I've had three mountain ash fall on the property. Um, I feel your pain, I know what it's like, it's a pain. But I mean, Kalorama, Kalorama obviously got really sort of hit extremely hard. We do do a lot of work in the Kalorama area as well, and a lot of the other pockets further afield that also, you know, there's little spots where, um, for some reason, the wind, like, like Monbulk off David Hill Road behind this high school, just got absolutely annihilated in that storm. So, yeah, so I just thought I'd, um, I'd embellish a little bit on what um, Annette was saying. I'll please give me a buzzer because I can talk the ears off anybody. <laughs> um, uh, I'll quickly show you this. There's a few bits of information here that you might find handy. I've brought some tools along. What I, what I really would like to show you today is what can be done with a really basic set of tools. Um, so sometimes when we're in a yard, and my yard's the same, I've got sycamores, ivy, I only take people down a certain part of the garden. Mm -hmm. Look at all the great work I've done, just keep pushing them that way and showing them the ivy. Yeah, um, <laughs> so we're all, we're all doing it, we're all doing it. I'm the plumber with the toilet that doesn't work, you know. The top chef that eats things on toast, that's me. We're all at it. So um, I just thought we could um, look at some really practical things that can be done with with um, some really simple tools. Because sometimes you feel like you've got to have an excavator or a digger or just, yeah. Um, and maybe a glass of wine, that helps too, yeah. <coughs> so, I thought we'd talk about, what, firstly, very quickly, because I know I don't have a lot of time, um, what is a weed? Often we'll just determine that as something that's a plant in the wrong place. Now, that that's a massive open definition of how you determine a weed. It, 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 it's, it's very open to interpretation. It might be in your garden if you've got a, you know, like an English style cottage garden, there's a plant that you don't want growing that's sort of meandering into a particular uh, place. It might be the nightshade with the um, with the Indian weed and the two sort of out competing. You want the Indian weed, but you don't want the nightshade because it set the scene for a lot of the other native plants to sort of like offer some protection to those native plants that are going to come up and through. So. Um, yeah, it can be different in your garden, it's different in nature, it's different in agriculture. So it's, re it's very hard sometimes to say that's a weed and, and that's not, because sometimes things behave in strange ways. Um, and actually, in, I mean, as I've pointed out there, bracken, for example, bracken in some recovery areas can be really good habitat for certain sort of animals, set the scene, provide some protection, but terrible in pasture, and it might be overtaking areas of your garden, you might want to handle it different ways. Um, there are also many native plants which have become naturalised in certain areas that form some of the most serious weeds that you could uh, potentially um, deal with. So for example in Calorama, uh, if anyone's dealt or have got mountain cedar wattle on the drier slopes, it goes crazy, a lot of the wattles sort of uh, can do that. Um, Sallow wattle is another one, you get that off Channel 10 track and sort of up if you go in Richardson's, Mount Ev. Quite a lot of salad model comes up through there. Sweet potosperum, obviously. Um, uh, that comes, you know, there's a, a feature throughout the hills. So you've got some of those species which can, which can cause problems. So it's not just a, a, a plant that's from South Africa, although there's plenty of South African plants that are big problems here. And there are plenty of our plants that are a big problem in South Africa. <laughs> so we, we did do a trade with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so characteristics of a weed, um, opportunistic, vigorous, often prolific cedars, exclude and outcompete desirable vegetation. That could be the weeds in your veggie patch outcompeting your lettuces. I mean, there, it, it's, it's, it's open in that, in that um, obviously, the definition of a weed depends on the context that you're looking at. Can form dense monocultures and outcompete <coughs> a lot of other vegetation. Um, and they often take... They, they often take advantage of things like storm events, particularly in um, you know very modified landscapes, which is, let's face it, most landscapes. So it would be at our garden, or be it in reserves or national parks. You'll you'll often find the light gets in, and all of a sudden something turns up, and you're like, where did that come from? It's just been laying lying in wait. We see that constantly, and we're working through storm affected areas. Even last week, I was in um, uh, Doongala, so down the bottom end near the Pony Club. Literally, it was like an obstacle course. I don't know how many step. I should have had the step counter on. That's for sure. Lost about three kilos. But there's weeds there with the light that you just 
come from, um, and that brought one up with inquiry, which is, has exploded in certain areas, um, in areas where we haven't seen maybe the odd straggler, but it's taking, obviously, advantage of that situation. What's also really important, particularly in recovery phase, is something that doesn't always get thought about, I don't think, because we can be very weed focused, and that's sometimes the difference between, let's say, what I do, bush regeneration and weed control, is that weeds can, even in a highly modified landscape, they can actually form quite valuable habitat as well. So, for example, um, uh, southern brown bandicoots, we, bandicoots are in the hills. In fact, you've got long-nosed bandicoots in the Linda, up near the falls. I've got, had cameras up in there, so there are bandicoots up there. More southern brown bandicoots are seen in the Kaikuyu field and blackberry field drains and channels than they are in the nice intact bushland because for them they don't really care what it is. The structure and the protection that the blackberry and the Kaikuyu offers is what's really, really important. So another one is red cestrum. We do a lot of work on red cestrum. That's come up a lot in areas after the fires. Um, Spine bills and a whole heap of small critters love that as cover. Now, unfortunately, so do some of our introduced <coughs> um, uh, nasties like foxes, and obviously rabbits can get there as well. But uh, thickets of blackberry, you can knock out thickets of blackberry. I don't know how many times I've been working on blackberry flushed out, um, possums out of their drays, fairy wrens out of their nests. Um, and, and so, like, um, sometimes when we're in our gardens and it's looking chaotic, think, okay, well, what was there? There was some structure, there was some really nice prickly current bush down there, or maybe you had um, an introduced shrub that was off. You'd always see particular birds in, a honey eater of some species, and that's gone, and something else has got going, and all of a sudden that's fruiting, like a kangaroo apple, that's fruiting, and all of a sudden you're seeing other little birds buzzing in there, even though it's bugging you and it's in the way and its branches are collapsing. But sometimes the form of the vegetation can be as important, and um, a lot of native critters do need that, particularly we're given we're dealing with a very modified landscape. So it's something we often think about when we're doing our work in the bush, and something it's worth particularly we're recovering in our gardens, but sometimes so are the native animals as well. Um, so you know, I've got a camellia at home. It's like three pot. It's like a mop, an apartment building, you know. And I've got another um, introduced uke, a Queensland brush fox, and. I'll, I'll see sugar gliders in it, and uh, yeah, and I won't go into my weeds, but anyway. Um, not everything's like that, but it's just, a good, it's just a good thing to think about, yeah, because, um, you know, we, we change the place, all these animals move in, we change the place again, all the animals are going, can you guys just make your mind up, you know, what do you want? So they're going crazy, and they're in recovery mode as well. So that's something to think about, I'll keep going, because I know, I've got heaps of photos I want to show you, that's all. Um, okay. Can be an overwhelming and daunting task. I'll rephrase that: is an overwhelming yes. and daunting <laughs> task. Yeah, excuse that. Yeah. Um, that's my grandpa's face. He was an awesome gardener. Mm. He was the best gardener. Yeah. A little bit and often um, work from the good areas out. Get a win. So if you've got a whole garden, you're going, "Oh my god, what am I going to do with this?" You're probably not going to get it all done at that period of time. Just find a patch, size of the table. You've got something there you love. Plant something you love. <coughs> get involved in that section. Just look after that bit. Get your confidence back. That's really, really important. So find areas you can you can actually get some confidence and, and re-engage. I did that the other day in my garden. I was pulling out ivy and Italian arums, which is another little uh, weed. And it's been driving me nuts. I've had 30 mother shield ferns that I've propagated off other ferns in my garden. I just went in the garden and did it. I, I totally lost it in my garden. I'm like, Never have any time to do mine. I'm always out doing other stuff. I put, the, I went inside. And went, this is great. And I had a glass of wine, and then had another glass of wine. I better stop. Yeah, but it was really good to just re-engage in the garden, and that's really important because it, it's too much. We've all got, we should, we've all got blocks. We've got half an acre in the dandenongs. It's brutal. It's unforgiving. Yeah, and we all know that. So find those little pockets you can get some wins. Um, Eradication of weeds in many instances is almost, I mean, you can get wins with them, but look to management rather than eradication. And often with weeds, one of the things that I'll think about, we might be working on a particular pocket, but we need to keep the pressure off that area in the long term. So I might have an area here with like inkweed, 
that we're controlling here. And I can see that the Tutson, which is another weed that's over there, is, is flowering and is about to go bonkers. And I've just created this lovely bare area. There's ferns and other stuff there. What could I do with the Tutson? Because I, I haven't got the time, because we, we don't have the time, do we? None of us really have enough. I mean, we'd love to have the time, but we've got, a, we're a, we've got kids, we've got life, we've got jobs, we've got Goes clean, has to paint, whatever it is to do. We've all got stuff to do as well. So if you have a limited time, it's easy. You can do anything you want. Um, but keep the pressure off that. I might just try and make sure that that tutsum doesn't seed. So if I can stop it from seeding, it's still there. But if I can just stop it, it flowers. It's like your agapanthus. Let it flower, enjoy it, off with the heads, which is one of the um, weed wipe. Take, take the aggie heads off at that time. The aggies will get bigger and tougher. You'll need the bulldozers to get them out, but they're not going to spread in the bushland or go to areas that you don't necessarily want them. So focus on those things. Like, I'm going to hand weed that. I'm going to get that good. I'm going to put... I'm going to put my native um, sedges and herbs and grasses back there, get a couple of shrubs in, and that touch, and there's no way I'm going to let that seed get back in there. So I'll get the brush cutter on or somebody in and bang, knock it down. It'll have another go at you, but that's okay. You just have another go at it. You're not eradicating it, but you're managing it. So if you can focus on management, not just eradication, it also, and then you get a little patch going that gets your confidence back, you can... You start to feel good about it again. You can see some, you can see some changes. Um, so I think that's really, really, um, really important. And just understand that when things, it took a long time for our gardens to, get, you know, before storms or anything, it took a long time for them to get the way that they were. And even with a lot of weed infestations when we're working in the bush, I'll get to an area and go, oh my god, no one's been here for thirty years, and I've got five thousand dollars to do something, and I'm like, oh yeah. This is a real problem. But then I've got to kind of go, okay, but I'm, this might be that year one of what potentially could be a 10 year project. Project. Where am I going to be in 10 years? Um, 60 and arthritis in my knees or, yeah, all that. But anyway, I, I'll hopefully in 10 years be back here and slow and steady wins the race and then follow up. Never take on more than you can follow up. If you can't follow it up, you could create more of a problem. As Annette said, you could allow other weeds to, to infiltrate those areas. Um, so a little bit and often, don't take on more than you can follow up. Small areas, easy wins. Management, not always eradication. Does that make sense, class? Mm -hmm. Is that good? Yeah, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'm cheeky. Yeah. I think the other thing, um, I won't go through the weed species, but weeds are a symptom, not a cause. They're just reacting. Um, the, the, the cause is us, or a storm event, or something you've done. They're, not, they're just going, oh great, they don't care, they're just trying to survive, just like a fox. The foxes are evil, no they're not, they're just trying to, they're just an animal that's trying to live and, and do their thing. Of course they cause a lot of harm, but they're not like going home saying, so I'm really going to do them in tomorrow. I'm really good, you know, like that's a human thing. They're just trying to eat, survive, and raise their kids. Yeah, um, and, and that's the same with you know, plants. They just want to flower, set seed, and let their offspring go. So um, they're often, so sometimes you can tip things in the balance, you know, in your favour. So sort of look at, don't, don't so much focus on kind of a, for want of another word, a reductionist sense. Look at the, look at it big picture, what's happening here. Just taking a step back and observing can sometimes be a really good thing. Why is it doing that? I didn't realise my grey water was shooting down there. Hang on a second, what's going on there? Or, you know, there could be a reason why something is coming up in a certain spot. There usually is. Um, we see it with stormwater runoff all the time. Road, channel, um, creeping buttercup, boom. It's like, how are you going to get rid of that? I'm not. Yeah, what do you mean you're not? I'm not going to get rid of it. I can manage it, maybe contain it, I can spray it and try and do all that, but while that drain's feeding into there, I'm not going to get rid of it. So, some, you know, you've got to pick your fights sometimes too. So, because there are some that, not that you can't win, but you're just going to throw a lot of resources out, um, yeah, which is difficult to, sometimes, yeah, you're not throwing in the towel, you're just being logical about what you can do in time. Yeah. Sorry, I know I'm talking a lot. Tell me when to shut up, please. Yeah, here we go. Exotic grasses, the most difficult, often overlooked. Nothing, nothing in this world compares to exotic grasses. Might not be something that people often look at in their gardens, but um, often in the bush, some of the most time consuming, resource intensive, um, landscape altering, 
plants on the uh, uh, plants on the planet are, are grasses. They're very difficult. So um, if you see new, if you see a new grass, if you think that one hasn't come up before, it's worth like maybe digging a bit out, trying to get a little bit of a, asking a few questions about what it is, because some some grasses can go berserk really really quickly. Some of them are weeds of national significance. Not a big problem up in Calorama, but in other areas like Chilean needlegrass, Raider tussock, not a big problem. For you. There are they are actually in Calorama in areas, but they they like the grasslands in some of those other areas. Another weed, sweet burner grass. We spend an extraordinary amount of time here. So if you're on site, um, Stonyford Road, Sylvan, so still Calorama down that way. Beautiful array of orchids, lots of sweet vernal grass, which is which seeds prolifically, exudes a chemical to make it sort of um, uh, to create situations which are more suitable for its own regeneration, dense monocultures will outcompete things. So um, grasses are hard work to do. So don't ever forget about those little um, but that can be fun with a little hand green knife and a glass of wine in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tools for the job. Um, whole heap of stuff. I just bought some toys. Um, I'll show you some photos quick. That's what I carry every day. This is actually someone else's pick because I broke mine. So this is um, Mini Mac, um, but because I broke that, I now use a Mega Mac. Whoa, <laughs> way more brutal. Yeah. But essentially, each one of our crew has one of these, and we walk around with that um, on our belt. So when we're in the bush, apart from obviously if we're doing things like spraying or if we're using those other techniques or, or a brush cutter, I can do the majority of what I need to do with that. Um, and in that, I've got a pick, it doesn't have to be this one. Um, I've got a set of, uh, sorry, excuse me. I've got a secretary, set of secretaries. These are unbelievable. You, that, that and that are my go-to. I do more with those than I do anything else. Two little hand tools. Some little guy's hiding in the bush with a little knife. What the hell? Oh, and... Um, and, and, and a master foods bucket from yes. the bakery. Yeah, yeah, they're invaluable. You can chuck anything in. Wheat seeds don't stick in them and they're fun. So I've got that, that. Awesome little trowel. Brilliant. Digging out bulbs, you know, angled onion. Oh my yeah. god. Bloody angled onion season's coming up again. It's all sort of flowering. I know. I choose not to look. <laughs> Bloody angled onion. I could talk about that. When's the angled onion session? Um. Um, mm. Probably my place because it's no, all no. back up again. No, my place. <laughs> yes. Child, uh, child control device. I mean saw. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, flick saws like this, good saws. Um, this is um, a Japanese-made one called Silky Gomboy. They even do one which is five hundred bucks called the Katana, and it's about this long. And it's amazing. Yeah, that's what the Star Wars fans amongst us. Um, so, and then, and then, obviously, that's on me, I'm in the car, I'm out in the bush, I've got that on, there's my tools, I've got my right gloves, that's a dabber bottle, I'm not going to touch that because I haven't got my gloves on. Um, but that's, yeah, that's full of magic potion, um, so uh, we call it Monsanto's finest, yeah, yeah, um, but, there, um, but there's, a, there's essentially a dabber bottle, uh, you've probably seen Dabber bottles, you can get them from council or you can, yeah. We've got um, a free one for everyone yeah, yeah. here today. I think you can get some today. If you want. Basically it's a shoe polish bottle. It was an adapted yeah. shoe polish bottle. Everything in bush region, everything in yeah. garden, gardening is just adapting, yeah. right? I'm going to show you a photo of something I did in a minute, which I did the other day with a potato peeler. I'm not joking, yeah. We went out and go, hey, a potato peeler will work this. I just like went, I'm going to take one. So I came out with two peelers and went, hey, this really works. Um, really technical stuff. So there's your dabber bottle. So that's in my little patch there. Just put straight up. Straight, straight, um, yeah, straight, straight, round up. straight life yeah. safe, round up. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So yeah, there, that's my toolkit, essentially. Other things, so. What do you call that, that thing you call a pig? Like, that's a pig. This is called, uh, um, I, I, unfortunately you can't get these anymore. It's a real, I know, I know, but I know. We have but I, I, I bought, yeah, anyway. So keep your tickets. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 bought, I bought a few toys. <laughs> when do I, have I got to show up yet? I just want to show my photos. That's yeah, show your photos. All right, anyway, these were made by a guy in the Hunter Valley in Sydney. Brilliant guy. Um, he retired because he's just had enough. And I, I, I just couldn't compete with imports. 
Um, he designed and started to take the design overseas. Um, I was put on speed by Vicky Boyle, who was a mob mate, um, some down on Lone Key Group many years ago. Many years ago, I've been using these for like maybe 15 years now. They normally come with a uh, blue handle attached, bright orange handle, but he sold his business. The minimum he was allowed to order was 200 grand's worth of gear. I called him, he said, I've got a few heads left in the shed from the early days when I was doing prototypes. I go, give me 20, because we all use them, we've had them for years, and they are the best. Camping, everything, you know, trench around your tent, whatever. They're just brilliant. Again, controlling children. No. <laughs> I've got my working with children. <laughs> and that's Mega Mac, which is bigger um, and really, really gives out where it's Mega Mac. So I've got quite fond of Mega Mac. So, um, yeah, but any pick, any pick really, all I'll say is, is this buy good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Don't buy crap. Because you'll hate it. You'll never use it. You'll go snap with your secretaries. Like yeah, right. You'll go like snap and snake with your secretaries, they'll cross over and you're going, give it up. You'll hate it. Good pair of secretaries, and I've got a list of places where you should go shopping. You know, just buy Falcos. They're the best. Had those 15 years. I use them for everything. Literally everything. I just dig. If I haven't got my hand wedding knife and I've trundled off, I'm digging stuff out with them. I just, I've had a pair for 40 years. How amazing are they? Yeah, and you, every spare part, you can get everything, every spare part. So I'm always sore, why do I buy that? Because it's a metal handle, doesn't snap there, metal blade, metal, bang, replaceable, get new blades, easy, easy to get. These guys, made in a Sydney foundry, um, been getting their tools. One thing that I've been really enjoying is um, this little guy. Yeah. This guy's awesome because you can reach him. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, but, um, yeah, this is awesome. Is that, oh, I kind of called my Bruce Lee. Has anyone seen Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon? He yes. <laughs> anyway, but this is really good for like scratching out little annual weeds. Uh, we use these a lot, and I've been using this a lot on a weed, a, a weed that doesn't get talked about a lot, probably on a time of day, called Neat Feather Moss, which is a moss, which is an extremely problematic moss. And we've been using these to get in and amongst vegetation. Bloody brilliant in the veg patch too. Again, from the Sydney foundry that makes these. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can have, uh, if you need this PDF, it's just a ba really basic PDF with me with a cup of tea this morning. Um, I've got a look, there's information like on some supplies. So I, I, maybe I shouldn't be promoting. I'm not like, I'm, that's okay. That's I okay. mean, the thing is, yeah. it's, it's no use telling, it's no use sharing. It's no use going to me. It's no use going, I'll go here or go there or go there. This is where you go. For your stuff. So if you want chemical or certain things, go to EMU as I'm on the road. Um, Scorby Road near the Bayswater Hotel, Arbmaster or the Red Shed is a mower shop. They sell the Bomb Boy stuff. Um, you go to Bunnings and buy them, 119 bucks. You go there and buy them, 79 bucks. Um, um, the steel shops, you know, like Alpine Mowers in, uh, in Mombol, Adam at Alpine Mowers. Classic mowers and chainsaws, um, obviously they stop a range of uh, stuff. Even if you're using a brush cutter, buy the most expensive, best quality, thickest line you can. Do you know what I mean? Like, just, just go for the good stuff. It'll cost you more, it'll cost you less in the long run. Um, um, this mob here, Forestry Tools, it's an online store. These guys are awesome. Um, they've got a separate section on bush regeneration tools. Um, and that's where I that's where I get the Gomboy um, saws, but they do sell these also at Arbor Master, um, and that's where I get um, these tools as well, which are little little trowels and, and hand tools, and they do a fork as well. Um, these guys are awesome. These are these guys are really really good, and their price is pretty good too. Yeah, well, yeah. they're actually um, just to give you a little bit of an update with. We're um, in conversation with Forestry Tools to get some product donated. Yeah. Um, um, so we'll use it for our lending a hand and then show them some tools that's moving on from there. We're also working with Felco to get some um, secateurs and that donated and Fiskars for a whole range of other products as well. So some of them will just be gifted onto residents, others will be used in our lending a hand you know, events so that people, and then eventually they'll be gifted to you guys, to the community. So. Call the Strail. If you've got if you've got a call the Strail, brilliant, really good for treating woody weeds. I'll show you a couple of pictures. Don't expect you to be able to go away and go home and yeah. 
You're not going to see Scotty from what's that show? Backyard Blitz, not Backyard Blitz. What's the block? The yeah, block. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to see you using it the way I use it, but anyway. Um, change doors. I bought this. This is a battery one. A lot of the battery stuff has, um, you know, a lot of people, oh, battery stuff's not powerful enough. Is it, uh, 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 yeah. yeah, my God, man, mm. this thing is an absolute weapon. It is absolutely brilliant. It's lightweight, it's compact, it's no It's way less noisy. Um, mm. There's no fumes. Mm. Um, you're obviously not going to get through a mountain ash with this thing. But if you're pruning, yeah, no, no, no. Oh, why not? Yeah. <laughs> why not just kick the mountain ash over and why? Sorry? The storm did a pretty good yeah, job. Yeah, it did a pretty good yeah. job of that through. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you need someone with a giant bone. But some of the electric stuff that's coming out yeah, now really is great. I'm really sorry to say, buy the most expensive mm. stuff. Yeah, the uh, cheap battery stuff, you'll just be like, oh, don't buy, don't, I mean, not that Audi don't sometimes have good stuff, but if you see electric chainsaw, cool, I'll buy 10 of them, just in case. Don't, just buy a Husqvarna or a Steel. I really like the Huskies at the moment. They're doing, this is awesome. This thing, I'll take this, we do work in Northern Western Port, I'll take it on an island. This particular battery, we'll be going all day with this, doing woody weeds, pruning, brilliant for the garden. So some of the battery stuff's come a long way and they're lighter, they're more nimble, they're just much nicer <coughs> to use. Sometimes, you, you know, you've got heavy lifting to do, you still got to use a petrol saw. But um, these are becoming really, really good. Do you know what else I've seen? One other little tool, which I haven't got here. Check out still, I don't know if anyone's seen their little chainsaw pruners. Yeah. yeah. How good are they? I just love it. How good are they? And it's got the They're insane. And it always just runs out. Just when I know. When I've had enough. I know, that's right. That's, that's it. it. The timing's perfect. There you go. They are awesome. They could not get enough of them in. No. At Christmas time, they were in berserk. Um, they couldn't get them. Yeah. They're brilliant. It's like a little handheld pruner. It's, like, it's a chainsaw that long. Yeah. Unbelievable. Like, so if you're, um, even if you're struggling with a handsaw and you're doing like cut and paint or something, oh, they're just great. And they've got a little flick up guard. That's cool. Anyway, enough of that. Do you want to see some pictures and then I'll shut yes. up? Yes. Cool. Oh. I'm just going to show you some pictures of stuff that we basically have done. Oh, brush cutters. This one is dead. Again, this is this one's quite a reasonably large one, but again, buy a buy a buy a good one. If you go, if you need a brush cutter and you're on your block, um, you'll find that bull bar handlebars are better for your back than you know the one that you hold like that. So, oh, I'm off to the osteo. That's it, you know. And then, yeah, so so the bull bar's good, and you can put a nice harness on there. They're more fun. This one's a you know this one's fairly grunty. Um, Still FS94, uh, if you want a good, uh, uh, or like the Husqvarna equivalent, so lightweight, they are still petrol. Um, there are, I don't know how people, have, if people have had experience with the battery stuff yet with brush cutters. I don't, per, my personal experience is they haven't got there yet compared to the petrol stuff with the kind of work that we do up in the hills. And, Sorry. No, that's, that's all right. That's why I was showing some pictures. <coughs> um, but yeah, so the, um, the, the two-stroke petrol stuff is still kind of the way to go there, but it's catching up really, really fast. So that might be totally different. I reckon two years' time, that'll be yeah, where it's at. But we can't go all day on a, on a battery one, so, and we do use them pretty, pretty hard and pretty aggressive. They are an amazing tool. A good brush cutter, will, yeah, it's well worth it. Um, okay, well, how do I get out of here? Let's... And so yeah, if anyone wants this, P, uh, just, it's just a quick PDF, and that, that way you've got those details. Um, just escape. Just escape? Yeah. yeah. But you know behind, um, if you go to Linda, and you go to... Oh, got Range Road. Range Road, yeah, and then it continues down the range track. Yeah. We found uh, some, yeah, um, this the only location we found it in the hills. What do they look like? Um, forget me not. <laughs> yeah. How do you recognise them from leaves? Leaf shape's different, flower arrangement's slightly different, and it's not something, generally speaking, what we see is forget-me-nots is a common forget-me-not. Yeah, what we'll do is we'll, um, I'll have a look on my, my natural list and let's get some photos. I just thought I'd show you, some, yeah, I've got 44 photos, and I'll do it really quick. Basically, these are photos that things have been done by us grubbing out, hand weeding, and predominantly using this gear here and also using things like um, drill and fill. So drilling holes into trees and injecting with herbicide. Um, so um, 
there are, there's some stars here, like, so, um, there's, there's Gabe, that's a heap of nightshade, and a whole heap of other nasties were there. So you can see Gabe, or you can't really see Gabe, and now you can see Gabe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What did we use? Brute force. No, I just, we just pulled them out. Yeah, just pulled them out. Yeah, wow. yeah, absolutely. And then did you burn them? Or? No, no, no. What, what, what's really important when you're in the hills, particularly because of our deep soils, if you pull a weed out, any weeds that we're dealing with elevate. Don't leave it on the ground. Because um, you leave a bit of holly on the ground and then you get a bit of rain, the branch comes down, falls on it, and you come back 12 months later, you've now got 12 holly. Mm. Not where you had one. They will sucker. I've seen just some yeah. of the most crazy things. I mean, we all know what's going to survive a nuclear war: agapanthus and cockroaches. You can hang agapanthus up yeah. there, upside down in a tree, and you come back, and they're still flowering upside down. Those things are. Oh my God. Anyway, so so, so yeah. Um, elevate. Get them off the ground. Get them off the soil. So That's what does elevate look like? I mean, what, what are you saying, bag it? Or? No, no, often we'll create, like, you might see some, like in your garden it's a bit different, you know, fill your green bin first, but if you've got bush areas or you've got a large section and you rip out a heap, let's say you rip out a heap of ivy that's in amongst some ferns or in one of the other garden beds, your green bin's full, what am I going to do with it? Um, uh, or you've got space, there might be a couple of logs or there might be some branches, you just get it off the ground, so, so you let air get underneath it, you leave that on the ground, you, it's a wet winter, things go crazy, you come back, what, it's reshot. Sycamore maple, same thing. Cut and paint, leave it on the ground, how many times have I gone back? And then there's little sucker roots going all the way along, so rule of thumb is elevate everything. Um, get it off the ground wherever you can. Um, even little flat weeds, like, if anyone knows, like, cat's ear and ribwort, sort of stuff, it, it, Broadleaf weed with the yellow flower, you'd sort of know those. I've, I've had days where I've gone, oh, that'll be right, I'll dry it on that section there, and I've come back and I've gone, God, who did this dodgy work? Yeah, and realised that the rain had set in and washed down a particular location, and they've just got their fine tap roots back into it. So elevation is critical. Um, Okay, this is actually a section of spraying in the secret garden, top of Parents Creek. Um, so this is beautiful. That's aluminium plant. It's a variegated leaf. You might, yeah, yeah, it's a bugger of a thing. Um, that we did spray. You can hand wet. I've been hand wetting that out of my garden. But this is, um, that was using knapsacks. So people familiar, I haven't got a knapsack with me today, but yeah, knapsack sprayers. So th this was a few weeks later. Um, so you can see the sort of the ferns are there. Very selective use of herbicide, certain types of herbicides try and do, um, do the job. I think it's important to factor here, everyone obviously with herbicides, um, you, um, when, I mean like from my perspective doing conservation work, th there are often ethical compromises and compromises you have to make to do what you do. Nobody likes herbicides, nobody wants to use herbicides, they're bloody horrible, they're made by big nasty companies, but they're a, they're a part of our tool set. Sometimes we have to use them. I might have to go to a site and I've got $10,000 and I'm looking at going, how do I maximise that? How do I turn every dollar into two? How can I use herbicide here to free me up to hand weed here? Um, well, how can I do that? So it, it is a tool. Um, there are, it, they often get used in inappropriate ways um, and that's not often by people who are doing it in, in natural environments, we're very thoughtful. A lot of us are, you know, we don't want to do it. We get caught in these situations. But I could have hand weeded that, and that probably would have taken me a day to do. I sprayed that in under half an hour. So there's a big, there's a, I'm not promoting them. I don't, I don't like them. They can be um, nasty, um, but used right, they can also do some really, um, really good things. So. It's a balanced approach and understanding, you know, often conservation can sometimes be dirty work. You're not always doing things which are nice and pleasant. I once had a job at it, I was so sick of it. One of the lines I had was, if you're chasing David Attenborough's job, one, this is not it, and two, get in line. Yeah, so, you know, that's what we're talking about. But that was herbicide. Um, here's brush cutter use. So, um, Mount Morton Reserve, Belgrave South, lots of exotic grasses, lots of junk, going crazy, oh my god, can't find the good stuff. I'm sure we know our plant ID, then we come back, we've found the poles, we've gone around the stuff that we still want to flower, 
that's when I'm trying to stop all that other stuff from flowering and setting seed. So now I was talking about don't let them see. We'll go, okay, now I couldn't have hand weeded that with the budget I've got. Um, you couldn't have hand weeded that. I couldn't have hand weeded that at home with the time that we've got. So you can use some of these other tools like brush cutters to really good effect. Even your lawnmower. Lawnmower is great, all those sort of things. Little snippers, all sorts of stuff. Um, another example, little spot there. Um, there you go. As I'm brush cutting, I've seen regenerating native shrubs and other grasses. I've tried to leave as much of the stuff that I want to grow up, and as much as the stuff that I don't want down, and not and not see. It's not it's not perfect, but again, nothing is. We try and do the best we've got, best we can with what we've got at the time. So. Um, weed burners. These are fun. Yeah, but shh, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's my mate Jared, who works for me using a weed burner. This is actually in a maroon side. But if you look here, lots of native, these are all native sedges, bracken and ferns up the back. This is a, a native a exotic grass called squirrel, ta squirrel tail fescue, Velpia bromoides. Pain in the bum. Got the weed burner in on that, and then it looks like that afterwards. And that held together really, really well. So, this. It's Weed burners are basically a flamethrower. Flame. Yeah. yeah, they're yeah. heaps of yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, extension holes that yeah. protect all things, yeah. and then flame. they're really good. There's one called the Weed Dragon. Mm. So write that one down. Have a the, uh, when you so you just connect it to a gas bottle. I mean, you've got to be careful with these things because yeah, my, you can set fire to your head and it's yeah. gone. You know, um, uh, and, and and like anything, when you're playing with fire. Um, register your burn, all that sort of stuff. But they are, uh, uh, like, uh, we use them in places, you don't want to go using herbicides in public areas where the public can move around, or there's kids, and you know, this is one of those alternatives. It, they can be really slow um, to use. They're, 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 they are fun to use, they're great fun to use, and you get better at them, at using them. But they're actually a really viable way to manage a lot of weeds. You don't always kill the weed, but often if you spray a weed with herbicide and kill it, usually what you get is another weed, or another one of those weeds. So if you think about that again, it's like, okay, oh, I've got all those thistles, that's great, and you come back and go, there's a lot of bloody thistles again. So, so you spray them again, and there's more thistles again, it's like, oh my god, what am I doing? So sometimes, like, that's that whole management eradication thing we're sort of talking about. Ooh, that's really good on a cold day. I always give myself that chance. So can I ask you with the burner, so is that because it hates the soil? Is it, is it, is it affecting the seeds that are in the soil? Well? well, actually, we use the weed burners sometimes to encourage germination of native seeds in other areas because um, we might try and crack open some seeds. Um, if, if we had a couple of days, I'd take you to some plots in Sherwood Forest off the old potato paddocks. Um, and we... we got rakes in and raked the daylights out of them to try and crack the acacia seeds. Uh, we then stockpiled material on top of them, got the weed burner and blasted the whole thing. The thing is now about eight metres tall. Yeah, it's incredible. They don't, it doesn't always happen like that. Um, sometimes with weed burners, you don't even need to burn down to the ground. You're just, um, you're just sort of like defoliating. Because I guess at the end of the day, what does the plant need to do to survive most of the time? needs to photosynthesize, so if it's not getting light, and you can stop it from getting light, so you know, people use black plastic and all that stuff, but even, let's use black plastic, it's organic, it's all that sort of stuff, it's also non-selective, so if you want to sterilize your soil and get nothing coming up there, that's, that's, that's no better than using a herbicide half the time, particularly when a herbicide can be really targeted and selective, so it's not always, yeah, so you can see there's a whole range of different things you can do, it's, it's quite fun. Himalayan honeysuckle, really nasty weed. Um, uh, that comes up. A bit, bit pockets of that in um, Kalarama as well. So this was Penn's Creek. This was us three or four weeks ago. Again, doing this by hand and cut and paint. And, and there's your after. There's your ferns underneath. Yeah. So this is just manual labour stuff. This is not like funky tools with great, you know, with drones and... Yeah. Um, here we've got... Native, um, here we've got red fruit sausage. Uh, up here, beautiful, Garnia Cibriana, sawgrass brown butterfly loves these. A few nice ones of those down bottom of Old Coach Road. And here we've got pampas grass. Traditionally used to spray these and you get a big ring of death around them. We've been working with a technique with chainsaws. You can even use your little hand pruner or hand saw. Then 
that there's that there's a pampas, there is there, that's it painted at the base. So no off target on any of the other um, plants. Small one of those you can use pick and grub out. Um, this was actually, oh, I'm, I'm happy with this patch. This is me on Holden Road in Mombok. Um, bloody pouring down and lots of leeches that day. There's my Mega Mac. It's getting pretty grumpy and muddy. And after a day, I'd taken that. That's on shiny shield fern. And there were hundreds of babies under that ivy. So um, if you'd come along and I'd just nuke the ivy with hmm. chemical, um, the babies could bite. Yeah. Sorry, Deb. I'll, no, 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 it's yeah. good. One of the interesting things um, that I've heard is when using the dagger bottles, it's actually to put some colour in there. So, yes. you know, put yeah. some, you know, dye. Get some dye yeah. in there so yeah. you can see That's what you've done there. and what's yeah. gone there. Yeah, dye is perfectly fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, ivy trees, we, this is manual stuff that we did. Dave did this lot. You can see his, there's his fondue bucket and map tool in the front. That's what it looked like afterwards. The aerial stuff will die back. There's one that I did. I actually went to the extent of actually ripping all this out of the base. This was on a fire break at Bird's Lane Reserve, and I really wanted to get all this trailing stuff because I just did this by hand. Again, with my pick, secretaires, and dab bottle. And there, there is, that's it at the end. A couple of hours. There, that's cutting. Now, something that Annette brought up with the ivy on trees is, um, is your certain plants will suck up. Like sometimes you'll be in a worse situation than you were before. Chop something down and all of a sudden you go, oh my God, where did those 50 poplars just come from? Yeah, or where did those 50 sycamores just come from? It's like, I can't deal with them now. But whereas sometimes the one tree that was a, you thought was a pain in the bum was just quietly going about his business. So you've got to be a little careful and selective. Um, but yeah, sometimes we use drill and fill on ivy. Um, to go back, I don't think I put a picture of... Um, Tree fern, tree fern I do, yeah. But with tree ferns, it's very different. You don't use this technique. What you do is, or what we will do is get our secchies. Um, let's say, for argument's sakes, you've got, yeah, I don't know, there's a tree fern. There's lots and lots and lots of runners around your tree fern. What you've got to do, because bearing in mind the tree fern is very fibrous, a lot of organic matter and material soil. So you cut and paint it, and you think, I've got it. And it dies, it dies, it dies, it dies, and you look up at the crown, and it's completely covered in ivy. You've got no way of getting that now, um, and that will kill the fern. It's dead from there to there, but that's not. So what you'll do is you'll actually get a sharp edge and scrape and expose the sap wood on the actual ivy runner itself. So if that had 20 runners on it, you have to scratch and paint 20 runners. I kid you not, some ivy ferns we've done that have taken three or four hours to do one fern. They're so complex. We even get up ladders, so we've got to work with hides, we're roping ladders off to get up them. They can be really, really hard. There's nothing more satisfying than watching an ivy fern, but you've got to be 100% thorough. Um, the reason that we also use that technique rather than cut and paint is if you come back and let's say in three months you kind of go, hang on a second, there's still a couple of runners that didn't go there. You can walk around that fern, revisit it and go, oh, I missed one and, and, and go back to it. So it allows you an opportunity to follow up. Whereas if you, um, this method is great. We, we employ this on the vast majority of trees and shrubs. Um, but even then here, I wouldn't cut too high just in case, let's say one of those runners is up there, there's a little hollow in the tree which has got lots of organic material and for some reason there's a bit of a runner going. I need to be able to go, hang on a second, um, I need to revisit that. Can I, could I scrape that now and just put a little bit more chem into it and, and then you watch it go, yep, got that one, done. So just like anything, it's always follow up. Um, and then that's often why, why I always say, once you're in, you're in, you're good. Once you're bought into it, it doesn't stop. Uh, people go, oh, well, you know, you get those big things going, oh, yeah, well, the weeds and we're done, and don't you take care of stuff. I go, do you make your lawn once a year? And is that it? As you sell the mower after that for the rest of your life. No, 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 every month I need to do it. Oh, it's no different than bush. So we're bush gardening, really. Yeah. Could you use a potato peeler? Sorry? Could you use a potato peeler to do that? Yeah, I'll show you some potato. You could. No, absolutely you could use a potato peeler. Yeah, yeah, but you've got to get a good one. Yeah. You know those hand weaving knives? These are, these are great because they're so sharp. Just scrape. Just yeah. really, but you've got to be gentle. Yeah. Yeah, you can do a potato peel. Okay. Mm, yeah, that's fine. I mean, sometimes we hand weave with butter knives. Like, butter knives are great. Yeah. You want to flick out little pain in the bum weeds. Yeah. It's brilliant. Garden rakes. 
you've got a lot of weeds that are a pain in the bum on the edge of your track, just yeah. get a rake in it or a little hoe and just chip them out. And yeah, they might not all, you might not get them all, but it's, yeah. It's, mixing it up is really important. So I'm, here I'm showing cut and paint. This is a young sycamore. This is a technique that we've been doing. If you cut and paint a sycamore, so that was a sycamore maples. Pull them out by hand when they're small. When they get a bit bigger, drill and fill. Works. There's an awkward size when they're about a centimetre um, to maybe a little bit more than that before you can get a drill into them. Well, you can't pull them out because they're just so hard to pull out. But, but unless, sometimes you're lucky, often you're not, cut and paint doesn't work because their tap roots are so deep. Mm -hmm. So you need, and the only reason it doesn't work is because you're trying to get chem into the sapwood here. Um, but it's not big enough surface area. So what I'll do, again, there's my secchies. I get my secchies, split it so I can get more chem into the hardwood. And then I'll paint and I'll give it a good drink with the dabble while they push it down and make sure there's some fluid. Similar way of doing it is like that. I've cut, that's been cut, oh, I haven't cut that, Dad did this one. That's been cut, it's a little bit bigger. Got the drill, drilled a hole into it and just put a little bit extra chem in. That's not coming back, neither is the other one. So you, you, we're trying to increase our success right here. Sometimes with cut and paint it works. I reckon, I'd almost say it's 80-20 that it doesn't work, but it depends on, and it even depends on your soils. There's all sorts of reasons why, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, potato peeler. Hadn't done this before. Does anyone know Bill Inkle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know Bill, yeah. So Bill and I chat and I worked together, we worked with Bill for many years. I go, Bill, have you ever done the potato peeler thing? I was, I, was, I was quizzing him because I've done it and I thought, oh, if he goes in and sees this and it's absolute crap work, you what idiot's done this, hope no one's paying for it. He goes, yes, it works. I'm like, oh, are you beauty? <laughs> yeah, well, I knew that. But anyway. yeah. um, so I got into the bush with a potato peel. <laughs> and I went, and, and so that's our, we call that the zucchini method, I think. That's what we've named it. But basically what we're doing is the same as what we would do with drill and fill. We're allowing the tree to survive, but, you know, so it can die because the, the, the sap was still working. The sugars and the water's still going up and down. As it's doing that, it's taking the chemical with it. Mm -hmm. Best time to treat things like sycamore, autumn, they're drawing down into their root systems. So now if you're doing sycamores, you're, you're, in, the, you're in the pocket, right? The window's closing, because when they go dormant in winter, you can still kill them, but you're probably best to go off. I mean, little ones, no problems, but you're probably best to leave them to the next season. Yeah. Um, uh, there's drill and fill. Drill, that's called a spot gun. But um, back in the day, before you get the spot guns, are like a tank with like a looks like something they use for you know in um, dairy and sheep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very similar thing. Um, but they are they are they are for herbicide. These particular units. Some of them are called a banana gun, and there's a whole heap of things. Before we could get our hands on these, we used to use master food sauce bottles. Yeah, you just don't. You just make sure you take the right thing for the barbecue. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah it was, it was a warped. Or the exit stage left pretty quick. Um, but you can see here we've applied drill holes to the base of this tree. This is holly. And we've applied them in intervals. Um, different plants, different intervals, but there is a bit of a golden rule. I reckon over the years found 30 mil spacing on the holes will allow you to, to uh, treat most woody weeds. Um, uh, a sycamore maple, believe it or not, as much as it's a pain in the bum to kill with that awkward size, very easy to kill with drill and fill. Very easy to hand pull. Um, uh, Swip tossings can be a little bit more awkward, actually, funnily enough. Um, but so, I, with those wide spacing. So, kind of that 30 mil spacing between the holes, about a 15 mil hole on an angle. Um, it allows the chemical to pull up in there. It's into the heartwood, but then it can drink into the sapwood and then it'll flow down. At peak growing time, you'd be amazed. Um, if you drill there, and let's say you had a root that came out there, scrape that root, you'll see blue running like a, a stream at peak ground. It's quite incredible sometimes to see it move. It can be sad sometimes too, because you're like, oh God, buddy, you've been here a long time. But, yeah. Roger, when would you, like, for those that have got hollies, when would you do drill and fill and not just cut it, you know, not just chop it down and... Okay, if you, um, if you chop it down and yeah. you just leave it on the ground, yeah. it, uh, it, it is very likely that those branches touching the ground yeah. will, will, will at some stage root. Mm -hmm. um, we will drill and fill whenever possible. Yeah. Um, 
um, you might, in your gardens, you might cut it down because it's in the way and then remove it. Um, that's different. Like when we're in the bush, if I'm down in the forest and there's an isolated holly, um, if I drill and fill, I'm leaving it in situ, it dies when it hits the deck, it's, it's done its thing, it's not a problem. In your garden, if you've got one that's awkward down off the back patio, yeah, you would probably chainsaw it um, or cut it. Your cuts have got to be low to the ground, you've got to get chemical on that cut um, pretty much immediately. Some say 10 seconds, some will give you 30 seconds. Um, we'll often add a couple of drill holes to allow to get a little bit more herbicide into the stump. Um, but you've got to do it generally rapidly, otherwise it'll suck up. And then you've got those cases with the holly, where I'm sure you've seen it, where the holly's, you've got the big parent tree, and for the last 40 years, it's runners have been allowed to go off, and you've got this, you've just got to unfortunately get in and pull that stuff out, yeah. cut and paint, snaps, da uh, secretaries, cut, dab, pull, 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 trace it out, get back to the parent tree, clean the branches. I swear I'm not joking when I says, I've seen trees treated with bottom branches and the tree has done this, touched the ground, the tree's dead and they've gone boom. Um, so it's really funny. The plants are there, to, they want to buy. Um, there are some trees that you can just cut and apply another herbicide to. We also ring bark things. Um, so sallow wattles and there's a range of species where you can just peel the bark. I don't think I've got a good photo on this because it it's not something we do a lot in the hills. More down, do a lot of ring barking down in the sandy soils. Um, but um, yeah, there are a few other techniques too. But hollies, sycamore maple. If you cut a sycamore maple, bang, it'll shoot. And you're like, oh, that's a pain. Yeah, so do it right, do it once next time. Some things, if you chip, if you chip holly, careful where you spread that mulch. Because if there are stems and you spread that around, you've now got a thousand holly. Um, so you've got to be really careful with your mulch. If you're getting mulch from somewhere and it's free mulch, you go, yeah, that's great. Just, yeah, just precautionary principle. You've got to be careful sometimes. Um, Potosporin's the same. Sometimes a full fruity potosporin's been chipped. You've got that mulch spread in the garden and you've got 500 potosporin's in your, in your, you know, in amongst maybe daffodils or whatever, you know, whatever, or, you know, your flax lilies or whatever. Yeah. Um, that's more drill and fill. That's a, uh, another holly. That's a sycamore maple. So you're trying to get it as close to the bottom as you can. You don't actually always have to get it as close to the bottom, no. Sometimes you've got to be careful because some trees are not always like this. You get to the bottom and they're like ringing, they're turning. Sometimes what you do, you could do it here, but you might be able to do a circle. You know sometimes you'll pick a spot on a tree where it starts to kick out a little bit. You know, it's got like a bit of a collar, creases up. You'll get a circle, so you need to get that tree. But as you'll see here, we've got holes in the main leader runners as well, um, because there's a lot of life that comes in there. And then you've got, then you've got, well, then this on the backside might go like that. And you think, how do I get into that? You know, because there's life behind the back of that. So you have a hole in there, a hole in there, and then all of a sudden that stops, and then it sort of rounds up again. Mm -hmm. I'll pop a hole a foot up or two foot up to try and get into the into that section. So some trees you do have to lead out. Now if you go too low and you trace around like this, interestingly you can actually miss bits of the tree and come back and go, why is that 10% still alive? So theoretically if you do it properly around the collar, you've got it, but then these big roots with some of the big trees or some of the really rapid growing, some of the really tough stuff, um, you need to need to add some additional sort of holes. So might be 30 mil spacing there, couple of holes there, couple of holes there, couple of holes there. I might, let's say that's a root, might have got my secateurs, scraped that and put a little bit of paint on that, job done. And um, I guess these are just things that we've learned. And sometimes, you know, it just doesn't go right. Sometimes you go, why did that one not? It's nature, you know. I mean, but these are the techniques that have been tried and tested for long periods of time, not invented by me, just, I learn how to use them, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's always new inventions like the tape and what's coming up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wiltshire make a really good metal one for 10 bucks, get it, Woolies, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, here, this is a job, Pat and Michael, friends of mine, Red Sestrum. I don't know if you know that one's a really bad weed on, um, um, but we're only doing one section of their place, a New Zealand wine metal. This, again, was done just with that little toolkit, and by the end of the day, that's what it looked like. So, um, 
I, I didn't hurt Asha. She was all right. So on this other job, again, this is a this is a Melbourne Water stream site. Has anyone does anyone have Creek Crunch? Anybody got little bits of Creek? Has anyone had any Melbourne Water grants on their property? Like their yeah, stream side frontage? So this job is a Melbourne Water stream side frontage uh, job, or they're now called living living communities, living waterways. So funding to work on the little sections of the creek. We control quickly current bush, wine bush, sestrum. After by the end of the day yesterday, that looked like that. Wow, so that. you can. Um, that's not one day. Sorry. Yeah. I didn't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's. The, but that's only two days. That's one day of us removing the weeds, and then yesterday we were back to finish the weeding and replant. And you can see that wine berry there is all going off colour. That's been drilled and filled. So I've used that drill and fill technique. Um, I'm not doing this to sell myself, I'm just trying to show, I'm just showing that again, the vast majority of his work has been done with what's on that table. Yeah. Is yeah. a prickly currant bush, is that a weed or is that No, a that's native, yeah. yeah, yeah, native, and the berries are edible, and, it, and they can be quite yummy, yeah, if you can beat the currawongs to them, yeah. Sometimes yeah. they're a bit chalky, but sometimes they're, sometimes they're beautiful actually, yeah. No, prickly currant is really good, awesome small bird habitat. Um, and it, they also make it, if you get like quite dead, uh, wallabies love them, they'll bonsai them in the oh. forest. So sometimes we actually, when we were planting out here, found little babies and we put some of the extra guards around them because wallabies will target them. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, but no, they're a great habitat plant and they can, they actually come up quite profusely after sort of disturbance as well in certain areas. So they're one that they come and be like, this is great. You know? And they're quite long lived. So, no, no, love prickly current bush. Yeah. Um, what else have I got? Okay, oh, yeah, this is the same section of creek, and that was not yesterday, but the last visit before, and that's what it looks like now. Oh. So that's the that's the creek behind. Now, but what you need to understand is that's not going to look like that in six months. Yeah. That's going to be full of New Zealand wineberry and red sestrum seedlings, and we are going to have to go back and go berserk on those because now we've we've yeah we've awoken a giant you know mm -hmm. and so this can be the problem if I, uh, and that's why this area was only small because we've got three acres to look after here with small amounts of money so you find a target area you focus on it and we do that the landowner Michael and Pam have tipped in some a little bit of extra money to allow us to come back. Uh, and, I, and I'll say to Michael, I said, you don't get in there, our work is undone, because you might not get a grant for 12 months. Can you imagine what that's going to look like in 12 months? Yeah, dog breakfast. Yeah, but so now we've done that, we're in, we're in for good. Um, but you will find, you will find, not only will we get um, regeneration there of a lot of weeds, but you'll see Indian weed, which is all over the place down there. You'll see, um, uh, kangaroo apple, so many of the things you're seeing after the storms, so we've created light, and we'll see, I get, we were pulling out nightshade out of there as well, but you'll see tree tobacco, if people know tree tobacco, it's a, yeah, it's just basically the giant, the biggest of the tomato family, really, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it, it can grow from a seedling to a giant tree really, really quick, so tree tobacco is a bugger, pull them out if you see them. very hairy leaves, very, uh, very itchy, Berries potentially fatal, so don't do that. Yeah, um, but we will get a lot of weeds there. We did a section further up the creek the year before, and we um, we've done follow up there with with weed control. It's never enough, but we might only get that back to a situation where it's 50% weeds, 50% native. But that's a real win, you know. We've added some structure and diversity to the site, just given how much time we can invest. Okay, wandering trad. Yeah. Yeah, love it, love it, hate it. Um, hate can't, it. Everyone hates it. Mm. Hate Sucks, it. absolutely. And it's not good for animals. I mean, like for dogs. It's Bill Incor. He hates yeah. it too. Yeah, I was out with him the other. No, it's not good for dogs. It's not good for anything. Bill, uh, does, any, does anyone know anything about the smut fungus? Good, cool. You do? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Basically, what happened is um, there are the, um, what's recently happened through Bill through research, CSIRO grants, funding, all stuff over the years, um, a biological control agent for wandering track was approved for release. Um, so what, um, at the end of the day, we're not doing, localised areas, 
no problem. We can work on that. On a landscape scale, the horse bought it a long time ago. It's here, it's here for good. There's 50 kilometers of streams, the stuff's a metre deep. We, we're not, we can't go spraying Star A in advance for 50 kilometers around creeks, plus everybody's block. It, you know, we're not gonna get that chemical around the waterways like that. It just can't be done. Um, it, it, it's effectively naturalized, so what can we do? Bill is a, just an absolute weapon. He's a machine, he's a genius. He's, I mean, he's got all of Australia, he's just incredible bloke. So, um, um, he has been pushing, I was talking the other day, I think he started the ball rolling about 2011 to get approval for a uh, smart fungus, a couple of bi some biological control to be released on, on wandering track. Um, there are releases of that in New Zealand. I think they've got six biological controls in New Zealand. But there was a lot of problems, obviously, because through research, they were showing, oh, that works really well, but that little bug also eats that. It's like, well, we can't have that. Or well, that little bug. And so it came down, I think, to this smut fungus, which proved to be um, the one that poten potentially could do some good for us. So what's been happening out in the landscape of the hills um, is that there has been quietly little releases of the um, smut fungus on the wandering trad. It is not going to eradicate the wandering trad. It just will not. If you're I mean, to put, put it to you, if you're something that lives on wandering track, what's the last thing you're going to want to do? Eliminate wandering track, because you'll die out. So the fungus lives on the track, it needs the track, but what it does do is heavily weaken the track. And if it heavily weakens the track, it might create enough space and gap in the environment for other things to germinate and grow. So the aim is, is just to understand that this is here, this is here for good, uh, can we come in underneath and sneak in through the back door and do something with it? Now that's not to say on a localised scale you can't um, go to your backyard. Uh, I mean, the, you know, this little guy, you know, I've got patches in the backyard where he's, it's great. You just get right into it, get the roots. Just got to, again, just keep following it up. The more you keep following it up, the more, um, Star in advance is a chemical we use on wandering track. It is effective. And you know what, we'll often hit it really hard with chemical control and then go back and hand weed. So sometimes we'll use chemicals to allow us to get down to the more nitty gritty ways of doing it because you, you're not going to get it all using herbicides. So hand weeding and spraying and all these other techniques. People say chooks, chooks great too. They suppress it, they don't get rid of it. No. Um, uh, chooks do not get rid of it. What they do is suppress it, they spread it, and when your chooks are gone, you'll see that it's now all over your garden, not just down the back. Yeah, yeah. So everyone goes, ah, oh, chooks, get rid of it. I'm like, do I tell them? Yeah. The under, and believe it or not, live birds do the same thing, because I'm, I call live birds glamour chooks. Because um, they are glamour chooks, they're gorgeous. But like in areas of the forest, where the live birds are, they're, you know, the 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 tracks like this. Um, and it's like, oh, they're keeping me down, and, there's a, and then all of a sudden there's a bit of trout on the track, and I'm like, it's like that. And then they bugger off another back section of the forest, and I'm like, guys, come back, you know, it's like, there's still trout here. Um, but they've spread this. What are we going to do about the So the libraries are the problem. <laughs> there's Bill, he's a legend. He's, he's amazing. He's absolutely, if you ever get to meet Bill, he's just, in fact, he's very quiet. He probably wouldn't be happy that I've found him. Okay, weeds, you know how I was talking about structure over form? Aramalees, Pain in the Bum, uh, Kirkham Road Reserve, Belgrave South, the place is Aramalee Central. Let's go in and spray all the Aramalees, that's great. These guys are going to love it, aren't they? Yeah, hundreds of them, southern brown tree frogs. Yeah, kill all the Aramalees, kill all the frogs, and while I'm at it, I've killed all the ferns. And you guess what? There's a big fat drain playing down into there, and in two years' time I'll come back and I'll spray the arum leaves <coughs> again. There'll just be no ferns or frogs. So that's what I'm trying to say about structure and form. So what we try and do with the arums, we use a technique where we wipe the arums with dabble bottles. It's very slow and very messy. It's not it, it dirty work. And you do a little bit and often, and then what we do is we've bitten off sections of arums, and then we try and stop the rest of the arums from seeding. Bit more, don't see, it. bit more, don't see. It. Um, and I might get there by the time, if I don't, at least I had a crack. Yeah, so just understand that things are, 
That frog does not know that's an Aaron Lee. That's got a bottle of water in the bottom, which is perfect for it to breed and call and look for mates. And then you come along and cover the whole bloody thing in camel, get, get a blade and slash the whole lot down. And, yeah, so. and also, if, it, if you can't get things to compete with Aaron Lee naturally, you might need to look at enrichment planting. Sometimes planting really densely gives it some competition. Mother Shield ferns are absolutely awesome at that. They are one of the toughest critters out there. They can handle so much punishment, they, they blow me away, Mother Shield ferns. So you want to get back in there, give the Arons a hard time. If, you, if that ends up being, if you can get that to 50 50, 50% 50 Arons, 50% ferns, when it was 100% Arons, you might have won. You know, you've got to be realistic with us. What sort of plant would you, um, let's just say you remove it? From a smaller patch, and you Lily, yeah. Yeah, and you still want frogs, yeah. of course, to have somewhere to live. Yep. Yeah. So, what plant would you plant? Yep. Yeah. Would it be the ferns, or would it be something else? Ferns would be um, often. Vinegar. No, the ferns are often really good, like because um, are generally in boggy, wet areas. Mm -hmm. So, ferns like um, fishbone fern, bleakum nudum, they like that. But you could be planting um, like some of the sedges and rushes. Um, the native sedges and rushes, the, the, they'll get down into the leaves and provide some cover and habitat for them. So, um, um, yeah, you know, um, tall sedge, tassel sedge, um, plants that will grow in wet down periods. But fishbone fern's a good one because they'll get under that, they've got big drooping leaves and they'll, they'll hide underneath. Even little ground covers like the forest hounds tongue and all that. We find frogs and skinks all the time in amongst that stuff. It's everywhere. You're raking away and they're everywhere. You'll find a lot of frogs and wandering trad. Um, but yeah, but that's they're just making use of what they've got. Yeah. They're making yeah. So um, yeah, just look at that area and think, okay, that's a big strappy plant. How do I? Yeah, I want up. I can enjoy it. <laughs> oh. That's my mate Tom's chalk. He helps us sometimes. Oh. He. He, that's one of the donkeys in Balboa South. He sometimes um, helps us with the ragwort. He's about That's our friend um, Giddy the goat doing session with us. Will this play? I don't know. Are the goats good? I mean, like, you, I saw Watch them. this. She's ring barking it. Oh my goodness. Look at this. She's having a bit of ring bark, a bit of a chew, had enough of this. Bang, head butts it. <laughs> Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> she snaps it and she rips it out. Oh, shut oh, up. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, there you go. So, um, I'm, I'm so sorry that I took so long. No! No! Roger, it's no, it's not, that, not that way at all. Um, yeah, but I yeah, act anyway. I'm good enough. Goats are good. But what was the plant that it was destroyed? Sorry? What was the plant? Red Sestrum. You know how I showed you those big bushy areas? She was down planting, but she got expelled when we went to put the plants in. Oh, okay. Yeah, because yeah. they were too, way too juicy. It's like this beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous salad. She's like, oh, this is the best. Like, giddy, go up top. Okay. Yeah. So, just a couple, just a number of questions. Um, uh, and I think that, that's been amazing. I don't know about you, but it's, been, oh, it's actually really, really good. So, some really specific ones. So. Onion week, angle, angle onion, what yep. do we do? Okay, cool. So if you look at the tourist road when you go down, like these days, you drive down the tourist road, you get there at the end of the year, or you know, it's that season, you kind of go, oh my God, the whole thing is white. Yes. Okay, so yes. what's the problem? Why has it got like that? Um, I'm, I'm not pointing fingers at authorities here at all. This is not, this is not, because it's, it's our, our problem as well. It's allowed to flower, set seed, and divide its bulbs every single year because the roadsides are not slashed. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's got free rain. So we don't slash the roadsides in the middle of winter. Roadsides rarely get slashed, and if they do, it's fire slash. So it's got nothing to do with um, weed control. It's got nothing to do with um, beautification. Occasionally roads will get done for amenity value. You know, you'll see the crews barrier, um, sidearm tractor followed by a dude with his cheese sandwich yeah. spraying cans yeah, or something. We just did it this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah, it's like that. And, <laughs> and I don't know, man, but that, they've tried everything to try and kill those metal barriers and they're still there. Um, but anyway, yeah, the problem is that. So angled onion divides its bulbs. You get mm. one angled onion bulb, by the end of the season that can be maybe six. Mm. So you've got this bulb that's turned into six. And then up the top, it's flowered, and it's full of gangbusters amounts 
of flour, uh, uh, of seed, and it doesn't get slashed, so it dies back, and it drops down into a gutter, and it rains, and the water goes, I'll just take it down here. No worries, cool. And next year, it's further down the road, and yeah. further down the road, and further down the road. With bulbs, you can get a thing called bulb exhaustion, where if you keep slashing it, and if you keep giving it a hard time, it will give up, but it takes a long time. They, yeah, it's we, not something you can do in two seasons. We cut a whole bank regularly and it comes up all the time. It can mm. take 10 years to get bulb exhaustion. Well, we've done it for yeah. 20. Yeah, oh. it can happen. You, it, it, um, it depends on the season. It can depend on your timing. Yeah, I mean, look how you're not going to get a weedier year than we've just had. Yeah. It's been yeah. so wet yeah. for so long that if any, it's never going to look as... Well, it could, but um, you know, it really has. It's been perfect conditions. But I sometimes have to think as well, you know, diverging a bit on that. Not only are we having a really bad weedy year, but the bush is loving it too. The native species are going, you beauty. Hmm. So there's a lot of good happening out there as, as well. And sometimes I have to take the weed goggles off. So I've been now like hand digging it, like getting Brilliant. down really low. Beautiful. Not, not pulling it because once no, it snaps. It snaps. No. You so get the bolts out. Oh, you get the bolts. But it, it yeah. still comes back. It still comes back. But what I did um, was I had a huge bank of it. It was probably three times this room. And there was three of us, me, my mum and my dad, and we worked for three and a half days straight. Yeah. Literally on our bums, literally hand digging. Yeah. Um, and then the next year we had probably about 10% come back. And then I, I did it again, and I still get, but now I've probably got three or four that come yeah. up. I met it, a restaurateur yeah. who was picking all the flowers. Yeah. Well, they're edible. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's, yeah, they're a garden yeah. escape. Yeah. They're a garden escape. I just yeah. mind mowing them, it stinks. It does oh. stink, it does stink. <laughs> but you go, you can sit on the roadsides. You go to any roadside where you can see regular slashing happening mm. and have a look there. At, at, you know, at the peak season, and look at the difference in density of the angled onion. Yeah. It's huge. It's oh, giving. Yes. You can hand weed it 100%. Um, and it, you can't do it in one year. You know, you won't no. do anything in one year. No. But you'll reduce it. No. And the same thing with angled onion. We, we will be hand weeding, spraying, and I will look at an area behind me and go, I'm not going to get to that. I know the bulbs are going to divide, but I will brush cut it. Now, when you brush cut it, you've got to go hard. It's not a take the tops off. It's give it a hard time. Like, use that brush cutter, get down to the dirt, give it some grief. Um, you just can't just whip over the top. A couple of days, bang, it'll put flowers up again. That's every weed, but angled onion just has every mechanism, in, and so do a lot of other plants, but it's, it's just where it's grown. It loves high nutrients, so we've got storm water. You've got roads with hydrocarbons, more, more nutrient. So again, it's a symptom. Reduced slashing regime, high nutrient flows, really strong stormwater flows, multiple methods of dispersal, and the other thing that uh, one of the key vectors of its movement is ants. Ants move its seed around. So often people don't go, how did that get there? You know, it's like, I bet your ants took it there. Yeah. Herbicide work on it at all? Um, it can do, your timing's got to be bang on. Yeah. Um, and the herbicides that you'll generally use on, an, on uh, angled onion, um, are either off-label and require a permit mm. or will do damage to vegetation. Mm. So often we'll be doing angled onion close to ferns, uh, for example, if we're doing that, that will knock out the ferns. So I'll, we'll often revert to hand weeding and slashing. Really dense start of getting infestations, yeah, um, then yeah, we, we, do, we do spray, but we'll use all those techniques and even rotate them. Yeah. Yeah. Oxalis? Oxalis is a really tough one. Um, oxalis, oxalis pesca prey, which is sour salt, which is the one you can eat, which is a friend of mine, to, yeah, you can suck on and it gives you, gives you a ping. Um, yeah, that's oxalis incanata. Um, oxalis incanata is very, very hard uh, to get rid of, yeah. Um, um, uh, again, the problem is you get those woody bulbs and then you get multiple bulbs off the, uh, and then you pull it out and they go shabang, you know, like, oh my God. Well done. There's a lot, wild gladiolus is the same. If I had some wild gladiolus, you can pull the main gladiolus out and there'll be 200 bulbs that just explode. And you're like, what have I just done? And you've probably created worse of a problem. You don't mean to, of course. We do that. Yeah, that's right too. Um, that's a very tough weed. You can spray it with brush off, um, but that will kill a lot of, it's, uh, that's a broadleaf selective. Um, that can remain active in the soil for a long period of time. It can affect trees. 
So if you've got a mat of it, not a, not a, not a good idea. You can isolate the stuff, you're not going to get it all, but yet digging it out, hand weeding, trying to get the bulbs out, giving it a hard time, sometimes just giving it a hard time, stop it flowering, setting, uh, when it's flowering is fine, don't let it set seed. So don't let things set seed. If, if you don't want it to spread too much, because the bulbs will split and divide, but they won't tend to split and divide and go 10 metres that way if they're sort of in the soil. If they get up and about and then water moves them around, or insects or birds, that's different. But so you might have a localised patch here, and if you don't get the bulbs, it might be that big next year and that big and that big. Um, yeah. Um, I used to get the double bottle on the gloved hand. You can do that too. Yeah, you can. You can. That double bottles can be handy. They can be very difficult um, with big patches, obviously. Um, but um, um, I've even I've even used um, just to like suppress it. Used weed burners. Weed burners great on it. Um, there's actually uh, if. If people wanted to try something a little different, a little bit expensive, but there's a couple of organic herbicides that are listed. So you've got Slasher and Bioweed Control. One's pine oil, and the other one's um, a derivative synthesized version of geranium oil. Um, and they're both contact, um, uh, so they're not systemic. They don't draw down to the roots. So they burn that, they burn that um, foliage off. Now, just because they're organic and they're pine oil and they're geranium oil doesn't mean that they're not nasty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're still herbicides and they can be doing pretty ordinary things to your soil. Um, and you know, and I would say, hey, eucalyptus soil is an S7 dangerous poison. So, so it's like, you've got to think about it sometimes. It, it's got all those warm, fuzzy feelings, but it can still be doing some harm, as can vinegar. Vinegar is great, it's organic. Like, 10 litres in the kitchen, fish and chips, and pour it all in my garden, and I'm like, you've got an acid, you're pouring acid all over your garden. What's that doing to the soil, the microbes, all sorts of stuff. So what, uh, what can often be um, seen is steam, steam is another one. Steam has been used in certain situations. Done, it's a, again, a great technique in, in certain applications. But can you imagine you were a frog getting blasted with steam? Or, it's going to sound like the boiling yeah, kettle. Oh, when boiling you kettle or, yeah, and that can sterilise other seeds in the soil. So I guess from a bush regen point of view, some of the big blanket things, like, like let's say, but we're actually trying to, we've got a patchwork quilt of vegetation and we're trying to pull that one out and leave yeah. the others. And that really affects the way you can do things. And that's where it gets really interesting. Just like your garden. Yeah, whatever it is you try and do, you try to leave the stuff you want and take out what, what, what you don't. Yeah. Roger, just before we go to the break, what other weeds did anyone want? To... What's the creeping one? There's a creep, we've got a creep, we call it wandering dew, but I don't think it is. It's got a flower. And Purple flower? Yes. Yeah, Vinca Major. When you put it up, it's got long, long roots. It'll probably be Vinca Major. That's, again, probably, apart from something like Oxartholis, which is a tiny herb, that is an extremely difficult weed no, to get. It goes around everything. Oh, uh, I wonder. Vinca is usually a ground cover. We've so, done that. Yeah. So if you. If Have you, you got a photo of it? Yeah. If, you, if you can send me a photo, yeah, absolutely. Check because it might. But what you're saying, I'm just a blue. Yeah. Um, blue flower morning glory. It's got a big blue flower. No, that's that one. That's no, it's a small flower. Yes, yeah, what's that? It looks a bit like trad. There is a native blue periwinkle. Well, that's part of Sam's time. Sorry, yeah. Which one? Blue periwinkle. Oh, blue, 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 blue periwinkle is, yeah, Vinca Major, which is one that's normally, oh, that's on, the, you're right. that's normally yeah. on the ground, though. It doesn't climb, I mean, it might clamber up a bit, but it doesn't climb like ivy or no. Japanese honey so called, or it's a bugger of a weed, blue periwinkle. A neighbour of Warra Road and Upway got some mulch with that delivered in, and it came up through his garden, and I was like, oh my god, that's, yeah. Um, blue periwinkle, unless it's very, very young, is 99% of the time we'll be using herbicide application. Yeah, it took yeah. a couple of years to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah, it does, and it's repeat visits. Mm -hmm. And again, um, what's really important to understand with a lot of things mm -hmm. is timing. Um, when you do things, it's seasonal. Um, when you plant your strawberries, when do, when do I, when do, when does a certain weed, you know, weeds, weeds um, have their peak growth period, just like any plant. They're just, they're just a plant. They don't know a weed. They're just, 
again, just trying to survive. So Japanese honeysuckle, when's the best time to control it? Not in, not in April, even though it looks okay, it's just pretty quiet. I'll get it in October and November when it's putting on heaps of lush growth and just about to start flowering. There's already a few flowers, it's super active. Yeah. What about Vinca? When would be the best time to... Vinca, Vinca is, again, in, um, um, like many things, around that late spring, early, early summer. But what happens if you get a really, really dry spring? You might go early. You yeah. might go in September, you go mm -hmm. hang So you're always reading it. Um, that's, and that can actually be fun. Yeah. yeah. You're kind of watching the land a bit. And yeah. I've got a question for you. What about this terrible, this like Peruvian lily, which is like, rise up, like, like a bulb, but forgot the rhizomes. Um, Peruvian lily, um, yeah. Alstromeria aurea, is it? The, yeah. That's what, it's all on the right side, big orange trumpet flower. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it looks like we've dug out. See the soil it's they really go hard. They go really deep. They go really, really deep. Um, they, you'll see them on the edges of areas and you'll get isolated patches in good vegetation, but they don't tend to move in. It's a big problem. It's become a big problem for us on Sherwood Grove in a couple of spots. And, and, um, it's more in garden beds. It is. It is in garden beds. But again, what we'll try and do, like the problem is when we grub it out, the wise only snap. And then, and then you go to dig it out, but the rhizomes are super deep. And then you snap a bit, and you leave it, and it will grow back. So we will often, where we, where we know we can't control it, we'll be brush cutting it. We'll brush cut it hard and hard, and it will come back year after year. But I know that I can't get that. Now I reckon if I spray that in most of my situations with, let's say, something like brush off pulse, I'll get that but I'll also kill every other thing I'm trying to protect in that area. So I'll put up with it, because I know I've got a couple of other fights down the road. So I'll try and just stop it seeding, and I'll try and grub it out, and grub it out, and grub it out, and grow it out, and do my hair and go, rangers don't go grey too easy, so I'm lucky, but my hairline is receding, and so I'll keep it long. Um, but, uh, you know, um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so you're just to start with spread. Just don't let it spread. Don't let this thing spread. Contain, hand weed, grub out, give it a hard time. And similar to like thistles, um, Dan had them before the flowers. Yep. Like now they're dying, you know, yep. the, 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 the seed pods are already gone. Yep. Now I, I don't make, I'm finding we can even kind of, we were working on, on a um, residence property as part of our lending and hand program. Yeah. We could actually, you know, you can actually pull them and get the whole. Yeah, program, definitely. But, it's kind of too late. I'm doing yes. it just to. You wouldn't do start. thistles now unless yeah. there's a rosette on the ground. Yeah. And if you've got rosettes on the ground and you're yeah. picking and you're digging, don't get your dab a bottle. A yeah. dab with a push in the crown of the fern rosette. Boom, boom, boom. Can anyone ever remember the zero weed ones? Yes. Yeah. 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 That's all you're yeah. doing. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So with your dab a bottle, it's just you don't do your back in with those things. Yeah. We used to yeah. have these ones with a big sponge, but God, they got messy. They were bloody horrible things. So if I'm in on a bank um, and there's like 50 thistle rosettes, I'm, I'm concentrating on something else. I, I'll be doing this. I'm working on Himalayan honeysuckle or some other thing. And oh, there's a few thistles there, and then I get distracted because I've got a short attention span. And I start dabbing stuff, and before I know it, I'm like over here. I'm like, where do I leave my pick? And I'm like back here, look at my pig. And I'm like, oh, like, Dave, have you seen my pig? And I'm. And so, four, dab, so you don't need to cut them, so just dab in the rosette? You can dab them into the rosette, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But again, with thistles, there's something that um, Annette brought up, they're colonisers. So mm -hmm. they can be a pain and they're ugly and they're unsightly, but over time they'll drop down. Because yeah. they're, what they're doing is very similar to the fireweed and the senecios. Um, sometimes I'll go to a paddock, a paddock with a patch of thistles has got more biodiversity than a paddock. Mm -hmm. because. You know, I've seen, you'll see fairy rings nesting in thistles. Yeah. They don't know it's a thistle. They're, they're not going to nest in the grass. They'll go to the thistle, you know? So um, I'm not trying to say don't get rid of the thistles, but you've got to kind of sometimes go, and they do look ugly, and then you can't get to your shed, and there's a fuckload of thistles. And they're bloody sharp, and they hurt, and they get you. you, and if you get them low as well. If you pull them out, get them low. Um, yeah.